Well, hello everyone. My name is Brian. I'm one of the curators here at Science World in Vancouver, British Columbia. It is so great to have you all here with us. Uh, I know we've got some people watching live today. Please feel free to add into the chat if you want to say where you're joining us from. Uh, it's all about exploration today. Uh, so we'll be asking you some other things you can fill in, just places you've had a chance to explore. And if you're joining us after the recording, we'd love to hear your comments down below. Uh, I wanted to begin by acknowledging that Science World is located on the traditional unceded Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh village site of Sanok. And we're very grateful for the opportunity to work and play on these lands. Uh, we have some wonderful guests joining us for today's event. Uh, during the chat there, we're gonna ask you places you've been, places you've uh, visited, maybe encounters you've had with wildlife. Uh, I'd like to share all the explorations that everyone has been doing. We ask that you keep your comments relevant to what's being discussed and leave space for everyone to participate. We have our technician, Madeline, who is on tech support. She'll be monitoring the chat throughout and able to help you if there's any weird technical issues, if we have any problems with lights or sound or audio, please let us know. Uh, today's event highlights some of the themes of a wonderful new exhibition we have at Science World. If you've had a chance to visit it, it's called Backyard Adventures. It's going to be with us until January the 9th. Uh, some of the things we're trying to encourage people to explore there is to discover the fact that science is in everything. Everyone can be a scientist. Uh, there's more to your backyard that you can imagine. And backyards are actually shared spaces, communities in which you are a part. Uh, a backyard doesn't necessarily have to be part of a house. Myself, I live in an apartment building. So my backyard is the whole neighborhood. There's a park near my home where I can explore. There's provincial parks national parks. We're going to learn a little bit more about that later on, but lots of places where you can explore, be a scientist, and discover new things. We wanted to thank Oblum Brown, who are one of the supporters of the exhibition and one of the supporters of the series here. So thank you very much for allowing us to present this event. Uh, as we've mentioned today, we are looking at ways you can explore your backyard or neighborhood. We'll be sharing some of our favorite ways to explore, and we have some visitors from Parks Canada all the way up in the Northwest Territories. So something else I'd be curious to know, uh, we see we've got people joining us from Surrey. Uh, if any of you wanted to let us know, where's the furthest north you have ever been? So in your own explorations, your own travels, how far north have you gone either in Canada or somewhere else in the world? Uh, for myself, I've been to the Yukon, uh, up in Whitehorse in the Yukon Territory. I've also been to a very fun spot up in Northern British Columbia called Atlan. I don't know if any of you have ever been to Atlan Lake, but it's actually the tiny corner way up in, I guess it would be the northwest corner of British Columbia. To get there, you have to go up through the Yukon and back down again. It's a beautiful, beautiful little community. All right, one of the great things about exploration is ex sharing where you've been. So uh, if it's a northern place, if it's one of the most amazing places, if it's maybe even, if you've discovered a place, if there's somewhere in your own neighborhood where it's a space you like to explore, it's a place where you like to do observations that maybe you think not many other people know about this spot. Let us know about that in the chat too. We love to share your explorations as we go. So our guests today are joining us from the far north of Canada. Uh, they are in Inuvik, in Ivavik National Park in the Northwest Territories. Uh, Ellen Preston and Kyle Mustard are part of the Public Outreach Education Office for Parks Canada's Western Arctic Field Unit as one of my favorite acronyms for any place. It is WAFU. So please welcome Kyle and Ellen. Hi, gang. Hi. Hi. Hey, Thanks, Kyle. Hey, Ellen. Yeah, so I'm Kyle. And I'm Ellen. And we are coming to you from my house all the way up here in Inuvik in the Northwest Territories. About 3,500 kilometers north of you, about 200 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle. And we are coming to you from the lands of the Inuvialuit and Wichin. Um, and yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about what the science and things that we do here and some of the observations that we've made and, and some of the travels that we get to do as well. Uh, and some of the important things about what's going on in the north. That so is very off. cool. Yeah, um, let's start off with Alan. Madeline, I understand you have actually a, a little map that can show us just where Kyle and Ellen are. So if you're able to pop that up for a moment there. Uh, it's way, way far north there. So if you know the Northwest Territories, you see the little inset map there. Uh, you can see where the tops of BC and Alberta and Saskatchewan are. And then way, way, way up is where Kyle and Ellen are joining us from. 
Uh, Ellen, you were saying this is your first winter up in the Northwest Territories. It is, yeah. I just arrived here in July for this position, and yeah, it's very dark and it's very <laughs> cold up here, but I'm thriving and I, I do really love it. It's it's maybe the coldest day I've experienced in any winter that I've lived through today. Um, <laughs> I've lived in very south places in Canada. Uh, it's about negative 20 today and the wind chills making it feel a little bit more like negative 26. So. And you mentioned it's very dark as well. What what's how long does light last up there? Today, um, I believe the sun came up around 1130, 1145 in the morning and it set before 4 p.m. this afternoon. Oh, wow. So a, a very, very short sunlight day. Yeah. And we'll be getting down to complete darkness on December 6th is our first day of no sunrise and it does not come up again until January 6th, I believe, 2022. So you, you have a whole month, like all through Christmas season and everything, it's just completely black. Yeah, well, it gets, I've been told it gets to a very nice kind of dusky tone throughout the day, because um, the sun's close, but it's not quite there. It doesn't rise, but the sky isn't fully pitch black or anything. Um, okay, well, we're gonna get a chance to see outside a little later, that'll be fun. Sorry, Kyle, go ahead. Just, just the way I like to describe it to people who've never seen it before, it's kind of like a fried egg. So you know how you can see the yolk, and you know where the sun is supposed to be over the horizon, but it never quite breaks the <laughs> breaks over. That is a fun way to describe it. <laughs> so what did you want to share with us today? Yeah, so because it is so cold up here uh, for a majority of the year, we were going to talk about some of the animals that call this place home year round and they obviously are very well equipped equipped for the winter up here and so we've got a few furs to show you from a few animals that are really well prepared for these cold temperatures so we'll start with this little guy this is an arctic fox and as you can see he's got a very fluffy white coat and actually in the summers, um, Arctic foxes change colors. So they are usually like a tan and black color in the summer that blends in with the um, Arctic tundra environment during the summer. But in the winter, you can imagine it's snow everywhere. So they're pure white to blend in with their surroundings. And this helps them avoid being eaten by predators. This also helps them sneak up on their prey. Right. And it's very warm and fluffy. So it keeps them well insulated too. And they definitely need it because the average Arctic fox, it's only about 10 pounds, which is kind of the size of your average house cat. So they're quite small. And they have these really interesting features that keep them warm too. They've got, you'll notice very, very short paws, front and hind legs, a very, very short snout and quite tiny ears. And this enables them to kind of trap body heat very close to their core and keeps them warm throughout the winter, which is pretty cool. So it's all down around their chest kind of area there or so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Very what, well suited for the Arctic climate. What, what would an Arctic fox eat? What are things that are prey for it? Um, in the winter, I'm actually not entirely sure what they would snack on, but I know in the summer they eat quite a few lemmings and Arctic ground squirrels and oh, okay. probably birds as well, I imagine. Do you know what they eat in the winter, Kyle? Same as foraging for anything else. So okay. they would still get that access to lemmings uh, and, and other small mammals and rodents. Uh, but they would dig into the dens and kind of jump through the snow to get them. Cool. Uh, and then anything that, that bigger animals like bears and things like that, uh, polar bears would be leaving leaving behind, mm -hmm. they could snack on that as well. Yeah. They... <laughs> Excellent. The leftovers of the polar bears. <laughs> yeah, they follow polar bears around quite frequently in the Arctic, actually, just throughout the winter to get a tasty morsel <laughs> if they it's leave a... anything. It's a dangerous way to eat, though. Yeah. <laughs> I guess, yeah, because the polar bear turns around and <laughs> you're like, too. Um, feel free, if any of you have any questions you want to pop into the chat. Um, I'm a curious person myself, but yes, if there's anything you'd like to know, pop it in the chat as we go along. We'll also be doing a, a longer question and, act, act, question and answer section at the end. Um, here's a very random question for you about the fox. You mentioned they go from sort of brownish in the summer to white. Um, is there ever a period where you see them kind of midway along that? Like, is, do you ever encounter one that's halfway to white? I actually haven't seen one personally myself, but I imagine it kind of looks a little, probably quite goofy during the fall and spring when they're going through that kind of model change. And yeah, but I don't know, have you ever seen one? 
only on the cameras that we have. Uh, so we do have some uh, remote cameras set up in our park to try and capture some wildlife. Uh, they're mainly for grizzly bears, but of course they catch everything. Right. Goes by and uh, yeah, you get to see some that are kind of mid, <laughs> mid shift in color. Uh, so yeah, they're like half and half. Fun. All right, who else do you have for us up there? All right, we'll switch to this guy, the big guy. The big guy. So this is a muskox pelt. Ooh. And muskox um, are actually very well suited for the Arctic, as you can imagine, too, because they've lived here for a very, very long time. And their coat are specifically designed because they've got two layers of fur or hair that really keeps them warm in the winter. So they've got their guard hair, which is like a it's very shaggy stuff. Yeah, very shaggy stuff. Uh, it keeps okay. them quite warm, though. It's very close to their skin. And then they've got their kiviet, which is this longer kind of wind resistance hair that hangs off of them. And it's rather shaggy. Uh, we've got some great footage. I wish I had it on me today to share with you, but um, one of our coworkers caught it just kind of blowing in the wind on this musk ox. And it's just long and just a huge, like, it's gorgeous to look at. But yeah, so these are, these guys are quite well suited. And they also have a very cool adaption in their nostrils too where they have yeah. curled nostrils, which allows them when they're breathing in the really, really cold air in the winter here, it slows down the intake of air into their lungs. And so by the time it actually reaches their lungs, the air is like a toasty, like warm, kind of room temperature temperature. So they're warming up the air as they breathe it in. Yeah, yeah exactly. so their lungs don't get cold and yeah, it kind of helps them maintain warmth throughout the cold, cold winters here. Yeah. I wish I had that. I've been to, I, I, my, one of my other cold places I've been to was Winnipeg. I had some things for, for work. They say, we're sending you to Winnipeg in February. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and oh my goodness, it just, it, it hurt the nose to breathe in. It was just so sharp and tangy coming in there. I love the different types of fur. If you've come to Science World, if you go up to our search gallery, we have uh, some beaver specimens there. And you can see the same kind of thing there, that the, the longer fur on the outside, that's kind of more of the, I guess the weatherproofing and then the the, the warm fur down underneath. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, I, I do the same thing when I go out. You wear like a, a jacket and then the, a sweater or something underneath. Oh yeah, the Pacific Northwest winters require all those layers for sure. <laughs> Has the musk ox fallen? Is the musk ox yeah. coming after uh, us? Knocking things over. <laughs> uh, okay. So I actually put beaver fur in my mitts to keep my hands warm in the winter. Oh, that's clever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's uh yeah, it's, it's really good. It's just an eco-friendly way to keep your hands warm. For someone who's never seen a musk ox, like I, I'll, I'll admit that is me. What, what does a musk ox look like? Basically like a giant hairy Arctic cow. So they've got a, like a really nice set of horns on them or antlers. Yeah, I guess they're horns. Um, so that the males can spar and compete for the females. Um, and the word uming, or the word, uh, the Anubi, Anubialuktan word for musk ox is umingmuk which actually means the bearded one because they look like they have big beards because they're so furry and hairy. Fun. Mingmuk, am I saying that right? Mingmuk. Mingmuk. So if you have any bearded people in your life, you can give them the nickname. <laughs> exactly. Now. Uh, when you say spar, are they going like head to head? Or? Yeah, head to head. Exactly, yeah. yeah. They've got very, very thick skulls up here. So they're well protected. Yeah. Yike. That's exciting. Yeah. All right, who else do you have for us there? Our final Arctic animal that will showcase their fur today for you is the polar bear, a classic Arctic animal. And many people think their fur is actually white, but in reality, it's clear and it's hollow. And the hollowness kind of does two things for it in the winter. Um, it's buoyant. So while they're swimming, this actually helps them float and kind of save energy on paddling through the ocean because they are marine based predators. And it's also hollow because this allows air to become trapped in it. And then it warms up with their body temperature and kind of insulates their body even more. So this helps keep them warm and keeps the water off their body too when they're in the snow and in the water. And yeah, they're really a beautiful animal. Um, and yeah, very well suited for their Arctic environment for sure. Would they have different types of hairs or furs like the musk ox, or is it all pretty much uniform? Pretty much uniform. Pretty much uniform. Uh, all the way through. Like, of course, their nose hair and things is, is a lot shorter. Um, 
And then, of course, they've got whiskers and, and things like that, like any other uh, land-based mammal or any other mammal. Um, but yeah, their, their hair is pretty much uniform all the way down. It's actually pretty coarse. Uh, not quite like a grizzly bear like you'd have down south or a black bear, but it's, it's just a little bit different. And it's got this, yeah, it's really interesting hollow structure, as Ellen was saying. Yeah, and you'll notice, similar to the Arctic fox, like it's got very tiny ears that kind of keep its head warm too, because if it had like big ears like black bears have, for example, that it would lose a lot of body heat if it had ears that size. Same as like when you're going outside, the first things that get cold, right? Get to your fingers, your toes, your ears, your nose, right? Yeah. So keep them close to your body and it keeps them nice and warm. Yeah. Nice. Uh, for any of you watching, if you want to add in the chat, is if anybody's ever seen a bear in real life, we'd love to know where you've seen a bear or what kinds of bears you might've seen or really any kind of wildlife out in the, in the wild. Um, we were talking before and you had some claws that you were showing us. Is that possible to see some of those? Absolutely, yeah. I was just about to speak on that as well. So polar bear claws are actually very well suited for the Arctic environment too. Uh, you can kind of see it's a little double hook there and this allows it to scoop seals out from under the sea ice quite easily. Okay. And as seals are like their main source of prey, this is like super helpful for them and they just kind of scoop them up. Um, this claw design also helps them grip the sea ice because it can be very slippery. And okay. their claws as well have a very like sticky residue on them that helps kind of stick to the sea ice too. Kind of like how winter tires work with snow. Oh, okay. So they're not skidding and sliding around out there. Yeah. Yeah. Neat. And just for comparison, this is a grizzly claw. So as you can see, it's quite larger. Oh and my although polar bears usually are bigger than grizzlies, Grizzlies just have that evolutionary kind of like aggressive trait, which is why their claws are so much bigger, and usually also why a, pole, or a grizzly bear will always win in a fight against a polar bear. So if 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 they were to battle, the grizzly would come out on top. Definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw actually someone in the chat, uh, Aloma, has let us know they saw two baby grizzly bears in Kelowna. Oh. Um, I'm I'm always nervous if I see baby bears because mm -hmm. uh, what 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 should you be aware of if you see baby bears? I guess. Any, any tips on just general safety around wildlife that way? Yeah, especially if you do see little ones, uh, make sure that you keep your eyes open for, for their mom, <laughs> of course. Uh, so in Ibibik National Park, we actually have a resident grizzly bear near our base camp where we, where we stay. Uh, her name is Bertha. Uh, and a couple of years ago, she actually had two little, little cubs with her. Um, and they walked right past our camp, and we made a lot of noise and and tried to scare her off and she just kind of looked at us and then kept going. Um, but yeah, as long as you can make a lot of noise and make sure if you are camping to make sure that you've got a really clean campsite, you don't leave any food or anything else around. Uh, we like to call that at Parks Canada being bear aware uh, okay. because you don't want to make them accustomed to having human food because the more human food that they get, the more they get used to that and then they go into more camp campsites um, and things like that down and around where you guys are. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And another saying that we say around here is a fed bear is a dead bear, because if they are a problem bear, unfortunately, a lot of the times we do have to put them down. Right. We've they never had to put one down in our park though. So that's, that's something that we're really proud of. Yeah. But yeah, you don't want to have them too close or interacting with people because it can lead to danger on both sides. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, fortunately, as Kyle said, we've never had uh, to put a bear down in any of our parks up here. And I think a lot of that is to do with just the fact that so few people enter our parks. So these bears, when they do encounter us, they are kind of like, whoa, what's that? And they just kind of take off in the opposite direction immediately. So fortunately, there's been no issues. Yeah. I've seen bear. one bear in the park that was kind of following us because it was curious. And this was a grizzly bear. Uh, and we set off an air horn and we saw it running across the tundra for about two or three kilometers and oh, it because they are very, very fast and they are very fast over pretty much any terrain. So that is a, another good tip to keep in mind that they, they yeah. are fast, so they will probably outrun you too. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, in a short distance, they will outrun a racehorse. So, wow. Yeah. You do not want to run from a bear <laughs> ever. No. I am curious, the, the wonderful specimens you were showing us there, the different furs and things, where do they come from? Yeah, so all of our furs, uh, they are donated to Parks Canada, uh, usually by traditional Indigenous hunters. 
Uh, for instance, this polar bear, uh, mm -hmm. she was hunted up on Saks Harbor, which is one of our northernmost areas where we have a national park. Uh, okay. It is on Banks Island in the Northwest Territories. It's got quite a few polar bears, uh, the world's highest concentration of muskox, so there's lots of muskox there as well. I assume that's where the muskox fur came from. I don't actually know where that particular one came from. Right. But this polar bear, she was hunted by a by an Anubialowit hunter, who okay. then said that the best thing that they thought that we could do with it, or they could do with it, is donate it to us so we could show folks like you guys. That's super cool. Uh, speaking of super cool, I understand you're going to be taking us outside where it's a little bit colder and showing some things. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Is there anything else you wanted to let us know indoors before we make the transition out there? No, uh, we will head on outside, but we do have to put on our coats and things because it is minus 23 degrees outside right now <laughs> and we are not built like muskox. So we don't have that, uh, that All right. hair covering us. So we're going to have to put on our coats and we'll meet you guys outside. Sounds good. Keep your ears and everything close to your body. I heard that <laughs> great tip there. Good advice. <laughs> Uh, well, as Kyle and Ellen are getting set to head outside there, uh, we wanted to share again, if you've got any uh, wildlife stories you wanted to share with us, feel free to put them in the chat. Feel free to add them to the comments down below. I'm going to do good YouTube things and say, if you want to learn more about all the wonderful uh, content we have on the Science World YouTube page, you can mash that subscribe button or hit that like button. Uh, you'll see a little sign behind me for Girls and Steam. We have a wonderful set of videos and programs uh, showcasing careers in STEM and STEAM fields. Uh, STEAM being science, technology, engineering, art and design, and math. Uh, if you look on our YouTube page, you'll find all kinds of ways that you can learn about these careers and learn about the people who do these careers. Uh, another very fun one we had from one of our earlier backyard adventures explorations. Uh, back from October, we had a bat expert and a bee expert. So if you ever wanted to learn things about bees and bats, check that one out. Right now, we want to show you some ways that you can explore out in your neighborhood uh, and some great techniques to kind of focus your adventures. This is something we call the seven wonders of your world. And I'm going to send it over to my friend Dale. So here's a little look at ways you can explore. Nature now. My name is Dale. I'm from Science World. And here we are at Queen Elizabeth Park. We're going to take a look at nature up close. All right, for uh, looking at nature up close, you're going to need a couple things. You're going to need a nice string, can be about uh, a little bit long, and also some little markers. I use toothpicks with little black tape and a magnifying glass to help you look very close. Uh, we are here at Queen Elizabeth Park. Uh, exploring a little bit of the natural world and one of the things I thought we'd do is do an activity I like to call the seven wonders of the micro world. In this case you could imagine that you are an explorer that you've never been here before, actually an extraterrestrial explorer out in space looking around. You have your own piece of string, magnifying glass, and what I like to do is I like to bring some little flags which are just toothpicks with tape on them to mark my seven wonders. Let's go take a look around here and we'll see what we can spot. When you're exploring around, you wanna look for some place that you think is really cool to put your planet. Uh, I like the planet to go right here. So we're gonna make our pretend planet, this is my own planet and I'm a naturalist that has come to this planet here and I have to explore this little micro world. So come on, you have to get pretty close because to look closely, we're gonna look all around for life on our planet and we're gonna look for things that we think are really, really cool. Maybe some food, uh, maybe some shade. I think I found something really cool. I, I'm gonna flag this one here, this big plant. And you know, you don't have to know what the names of plants are. Sometimes just by looking at it, you can see it's a pretty cool plant. If I was going to name one big wonder, this is the tallest point. I'll flag that one. Let's take a look at what other things I like in here. Oh, there's a whole bunch of seeds here. Come on a little closer and take a look. Right here, we have a ton of little tiny tufts 
of the, looks like maybe some old dandelion seeds. So we'll flag that. That looks like good food. Seeds are good food for all sorts of animals. And I'm sure if there's any animals on this planet, we might be able to, to they might be able to eat right there. A good place to stake out. Hmm. Maybe we'll mark this one too, because underneath here, it looks like there's well, <laughs> quite a bit of decomposing leaf litter and bits of old bark. Good places for things to hide under. Well, that's the seven wonders of the world. Although I only looked at three, you can do as many as you want. You can go out and take a look. Sometimes you'll find things living on your world. You can name them. You can identify them. Yeah. We discovered all sorts of very tiny animals and tiny plants. Check out more amazing videos at our Science World website or share some with us at hashtag show us your science. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Dale. It was super fun. Uh, I love going out and exploring in my neighborhood and finding new things or surprising things. And just oftentimes it's just things that make me curious, things that make me ask questions that why is that coming out that way? Uh, why do these things interact or how did that grow that way? Uh, right now we're going to learn some things about outside with Ellen and Kyle. So let's go up to the Northwest Territories and we are now in the backyard. Oh my goodness, it is dark out there. How's it going? Uh, it got really dark and it's pretty cold, but, uh, <laughs> but you know, it's uh, always a beautiful day to get outside and, and just learn about stuff that's going on out here, you know? Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about snow and why snow is important for people up here. Snow and ice. What have you got there? What do I have here? So I have, this is a traditional snow knife and it okay. is made from a whale's rib bone. Okay. So... Hopefully, uh, people, if they're curious how people survived out on the land and out on the, on the open water here um, with shelter and things, in the winter, they would make an igloo. And this is how they would make it, is this traditional snow knife. Okay. So before there were metal tools, they used a lot of bone. And what they would do, because snow is a really, really cool substance, not only because it's cold, but because it has a lot of room for air to get in. So much like the... Uh, the hollow fur of the polar bear, there's a lot of room for air to come in and insulate. Okay. Same with the insulation in your home. That will keep you nice and warm if you make this igloo. So what they would do is I've got a block here and I'm just going to chop it if you want to camera down for me. Ellen's also my light. She's got a headlamp on. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if I can grab some snow here. Oh, there we go. That's a pretty good block. And what they would do is they would grab it and then chop and make a really nice flat surface like that. Make it chop off a little bit more. There's a wind going up there too. So the snow here is a little bit different than the snow that you get in Vancouver. But if you do get enough snow or if you go into the mountains, highly recommend going, grabbing, making some, uh, making some blocks, making yourself a snow fort. Just like that, I've got a pretty perfect brick, right? The brick that we'll be making an igloo with would be a lot bigger than this. Right. But this is a really good example. And that didn't take me very long at all, did it? No. Are, are there different types of snow that are better for building with? Yeah, of course. I mean, you get these snow that has a little bit more moisture in it that uh, can pack down a lot better. But the snow that we have here is really, really dry. So I'm just going to grab some snow from in front of me here and just show you how dry it is. So if I tried to pack this down and make a snowball, you can just see how it's coming out everywhere, right? It doesn't really make a snowball, and now it's up my sleeve. But, <laughs> but that's okay. Um, so this snow isn't very good for packing or making an igloo yet. Um, what happens here is that we don't actually get that much snow. We, need to do, we do live in a desert, so it is really, really dry. So there isn't a whole lot of moisture in the air, but what happens over the year uh, over the winter is that the snow actually compacts in and blows in together and then can make this really nice, dense, dry block where the oxygen can be trapped. And that's how they can make this really good block. But the snow that you'd get down south is a lot more moist. You can kind of really build that good snowball or snowman or snow fort right away because there's so much moisture built into it, right? Very if you've fun. ever been outside building a snow, snow fort? 
Yeah, if it's actually, if you've ever made a snow fort, let us know in the chat there. We'd love to hear about some of the things you've made or any sculptures or things you've made out of snow in the past, things you like to do when it's a snowy day. Yeah. Does the, the changing temperature affect the snow at all? Yeah, of course. The warmer it is, uh, the snow will melt a little bit more. So it's uh, so it is a little bit more moist. Uh, it's got a little bit more humidity in it, a little bit more moisture. Uh, but the colder it is, of course, it's going to be drier. Okay. Uh, which is why today, when it's minus 23, we get this powder, which isn't so nice. But the other cool thing about living up here is that we live on permafrost. So that is ice. And below me, actually, there is about 100 meters of ice. And that is year round. So if we focus around and show them our house next door here, or even my house here, uh, you can see that it's up about six feet off the ground. And what's holding it, it's kind of like when you get onto a coastal, uh, like the coastal cottages and things like that, that have that are built on stilts. Okay. My house is also built on stilts. And that's because we can't dig into the ground. It makes it really interesting for our super systems and thing here, things here in Anuvik, which are all above ground. Oh, because yeah, here in Vancouver, all that kind of thing is buried, all the pipes and everything. And a lot of houses have basements and such. None of that up there. None of that here because we can't dig down into the ice. And if we built the houses just onto the ground, it would melt the permafrost underneath and the houses would go, oh. which isn't good. <laughs> That's and we had that on. actually with the old school that was here. Uh, one of the reasons that they tore it down is because part of the floor went <laughs> right down and in and it was not a good time. So, so then I they rebuilt the school and they built it up higher. Sometimes you don't want things warm. <laughs> exactly, and another reason that you don't want it warm here is a lot of the traditional hunters and trappers that would go out, go out around this time of year because okay. you can't really travel over the land here in the summer because it's so marshy, because we live on tundra, it's very wet. Uh, we're in the Mackenzie River Delta here. Uh, so a lot of water comes up and through here. I think it's about one third of all of Canada's water that leaves comes up the Mackenzie River, which is where we live. So there is a lot of water going out and going out into the Arctic Ocean. There's lots of lakes and marshes and, and things like that. And that's why we get a lot of insects and bugs as well uh, in the summer. So in the winter, when everything freezes up, you're clear to go take your dog team uh, traditionally or your snowmobile or anything like that over the land anywhere. And you can travel anywhere now because everything's frozen. Okay. Uh, anything else we should know about being outside with you there? Uh, I mean, we could show you, we could try and show you what it looks like to have uh, grizzly bears come into town because we do have our bear proof garbage can that we have to use out here. Uh, okay. maybe you can see that in the distance. I don't think you'll be able to see it. It's too dark. Too dark. <laughs> but that's okay because you can see my greenhouse there. And in the summer, because we get 24 hours of sunlight, oh. we actually can grow a lot of really cool things because with that amount of sunlight, things grow really, really fast. It's a short growing season, but we can grow a lot. So it's Very pretty fun. amazing. All right. Well, if there's nothing else outside, we're going to bring you back into the warmth. And as you're making your travels there, we're going to show you some more ways you can explore. Uh, this time it's my friend Kathy showing you some fun things you might try exploring, not up in the snow, but maybe in the summer down on a beach. So here's more ways to explore. Welcome to Nature Now. My name is Kathy and I'm hanging out at the beach looking at sand. What is sand? That's a really good question. Well, sand is this stuff. Rocks. That's right. Sand is made up of itty bitty teeny weeny rocks. Believe it or not, some of the sand can start this big and then after a while it gets ground up in the waves of the water, keeps getting ground up, ground up, gets smaller and smaller and smaller until you get little tiny bits of sand like this. Now sand is made up of so many different types of rocks, it's not just one type of rock, many types of rocks. And the one that I find most interesting is a rock called magnetite. Magnetite is magnetic. It's almost in the name, magnetite. And I have here a magnet right here, and I've got it in the sand, okay? And now I'm going to transfer whatever's stuck on the magnet to this other plate. 
there they go. So there's all the little particles of sand. So each one of those is a rock right there. Now let's see if it jumps onto the magnet. Ready? Watch close. Oh, I saw one. Oh, I saw two. Now, if you're having a hard time really seeing what's going on here, you know what I suggest? I suggest you get a magnet. I just took this off my fridge. Get a magnet, go to the beach, and see if you can find some magnetite and other types of rocks at the beach. Have fun with that and put it on Show Us Your Science. Hashtag Show Us Your Science. Bye now. Awesome. Thanks, Kathy. And as Kathy mentioned in Dale before, uh, if you're ever posting some of the things you discover on social media, we'd love it if you'd use that hashtag, show us your science. Uh, we'd love to see the science that everyone is doing out in their backyards and things. Uh, I think that Ellen and Kyle are back. I'm seeing actually on our backstage feed, there's a little bit of frost from being outside in the snow there. Uh, Ellen and Kyle, are you with us again? Yes, we are. Uh, I need a towel on that camera. Yeah. <laughs> it's quite frosty. <laughs> yeah, it's a big change coming in. I was curious, the, the bone knife that Kyle had out there, uh, are there archaeological digs and things that happen up there? Or how do you, how do you discover things like that? Yeah, great question, Brian. We do have quite a few archaeological sites up here. And funny enough, like a lot of them are located on the coasts up here because people were living quite close to the ocean, because that's okay. where they got a lot of their resources from in the olden days. Um, unfortunately, because climate change is having such a severe impact on the Arctic up here, we're witnessing a lot of coastal erosion, and these archaeological sites are at a huge risk, because a lot of them are just washing into the ocean these days. They're just disappearing forever. Yeah. Yeah, so up on the coast, uh, as I mentioned here, we've got about 100 meters of permafrost below us here in Anubic, but up on the coast and a little bit further north, uh, they've got about 500, uh, 500 feet, sorry, um, instead of 300 feet. Okay. Uh, so a little bit more, uh, and but the thing is, is when that gets exposed to the sunlight uh, and the wave action in the summer, as many of you have seen in Vancouver, when things hit the seawall, when the waves hit the seawall, yeah. that seawall wasn't there you would have erosion and that would take away that uh any soil or anything there but because all of ours is frozen it also gets impacted by the sunlight mm -hmm. so we're losing up to nine meters a year in ibavik national park just because things are getting washed away and they're melting because of the sunlight and that 24 hours of sunlight is not great on those coastal sites I guess um, so. so if you guys want to check that out at home nine meters is about 30 steps okay and that would be on the edge of the the shoreline the shoreline is moving 30 steps inward as every wow. year yeah. yeah that is a lot of erosion mm -hmm. which is unfortunate uh, because a lot of these sites these cultural sites are along the coast uh so we are losing some of them into the ocean so we're working with our partners at the anuvialuit regional corporation and we're working with uh the community members and, and things and people like that that are um, where we can see what to do about these things. If we want to do an archaeological expedition or just kind of let them go and let, let all of those sites wash away and return to nature. Okay. I'm curious about some of the names. Uh, the, the town there is Inuvik and then the, the park is Ivavik. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Inuvik is where Kyle and I are currently living. It's a town of about 3,000 to 4,000 people. Whereas Ivavik is one of our national parks. It's actually in the northern Yukon. It's on the border of Alaska and the Arctic Ocean. And Ivavik actually means a uh, place to give birth or a nursery. And this has to do with the porcupine caribou herd that use Ivavik National Park and the land it protects to have their babies every single year. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah, so the Vic in Ivavik means place. Uh, much like the Vic in Inuvik means place. But the Inu for Inuvik means people. So Inuvik means place of people. Okay. So Ellen, you were saying that the Ivavik, that's where the, the caribou come every year? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they travel through it on their migration routes twice a year and into Alaska and back down as well. Um, I've had a scientist describe their um, migration routes kind of as like 
up here, they concentrate and then they spread downwards, like so, okay. kind of throughout the Northwest Territories. Yeah. And this is the long, like the longest land migration in all of the world for okay. these caribou in Ivavik National Park and in the Alaska National Wildlife Refuge. So we're not the only spot that they do give birth. Uh, we are one of their main spots, but caribou don't know political boundaries, right? They don't know when they're going into the U.S. or when they're <laughs> staying in Canada. So they also go into Alaska, which is just uh, just to the west of Ivavik National Park as well. So they don't have to fill out any customs forms when they're going across there. Yeah, CBSA doesn't uh, doesn't stop them at the border. <laughs> Does the, uh, the the changing temperatures has that affected any of the the migrations for the the caribou the birds anything up there? Definitely, yeah. Uh, climate change has a huge impact on pretty much every species that is indigenous to this area. Um, so the caribou, for example, it's a great example. Um, I'll talk about the blue nose west caribou herd, which is actually in Tuktuk Nogait National Park over on the eastern boundary of Northwest Territories. Um, so they also use Tuktuk Nogait as like their kind of calving grounds and post calving grounds. So where they have their babies and yeah, where they kind of raise their young. And because of this, the mother caribous need really like nutrient rich vegetation. And usually this vegetation kind of uh, like reaches its highest nutrient levels like around June. And this is usually when baby caribous are being born and just kind of like post uh, calving occurs. So it's usually in the past, it's lined up quite well when there's like a lot of need for these nutrient rich plants, they're available and the mothers eat them and then they have like healthy babies. But because climate change is kind of causing springtime to come earlier and thaw to happen earlier in the year, this green up is actually happening before June now, but the caribou haven't caught up yet. So when they arrive, the plants are kind of past their like most nutritious level and then therefore the mother caribous aren't able to produce the like very energy rich milk that they need to raise their healthy caribou calves and then they're kind of eating other plants in the ecosystem and this is disturbing a lot of other um, grazing species too throughout that area like musk ox um, as well as moose and um, sheep too so yeah it's not the best unfortunately um and also bird species and polar bears are heavily affected by climate change uh, i'll get to polar bears in a moment but we have a lot of migratory bird species that visit all of our sites each year and right. very few birds stay here year round so we rely a ton on the migratory songbirds and birds of prey that arrive usually in early spring a lot of them will show up while there's still snow on the ground and don't leave until after the first frost in the fall. And yeah, these species have major like impacts on our ecosystems up here because of their role as being prey for larger predators, um, as their role in eating all of our insects up here, which I am certainly grateful for because we've got a lot of mosquitoes. Yeah. Um, and yeah, they, they also are pollinators through their seed dispersal methods. They're super, super critical. So if we don't get as many birds as we usually would, or if they come later or too early, for example, this can kind of upset the entire ecosystem. They're super important species um, throughout all of our parks up here. And so it's, yeah, we have noticed that there are, it's kind of, there's a declining um, songbird population in a few of our parks and something we're definitely keeping an eye on. How does it affect the polar bears? Polar bears, yeah, great question. Um, Pretty, the obvious answer is there's a lot less sea ice these days and the sea ice that it's just not as strong as it used to be. And from what we, we do a annual polar bear uh, monitoring trip into Ivivik National Park each year in March. And we kind of gather data on when mother bears are leaving their dens. And this has kind of given us a lot of information about the denning habits of mother bears in this area. So from this knowledge, we've learned that there's it's pretty common for polar bears to den on the sea ice as well as land in this area. But because all of this sea ice is just not as strong as it once was, and there's just less of it in general in the past few years, we've noticed that polar bears are moving further inland to make more dens. And as Kyle mentioned, we monitor grizzly bear activity in Ivivik National Park too, and we've got a pretty solid um, population of grizzlies there. So these polar bears are entering grizzly territory, like prime grizzly territory, and actually in a few instances, we've observed that there are polar bears and grizzly bears even beginning to mate and reproduce together, which is wow. pretty, pretty interesting to see this evolution. Um, 
And as I mentioned earlier, grizzlies, although they are technically smaller than polar bears, they are just that much more aggressive. So they are always the ones winning in a fight and that male dominance comes into play here too. So grizzlies, male grizzlies are usually the ones um, mating with female polar bears. What, what are the characteristics of the offspring of a polar bear and a grizzly bear? Yeah, uh, fortunately, uh, we've noticed that most of the cubs that are coming from this pair are developing polar bear claws, which is really important because it's their mothers that are taking them out onto the ice and teaching them how to um, hunt their prey, seals. So having that claw, like I was talking about earlier, is super, super critical for these bears um, to have because if, for example, they had a grizzly claw, like that just, it wouldn't help them out at all with any seals. Skating all over the place. Yeah, totally, yeah. And not being able to hook seals coming out of the holes, right? Yeah. And would it be that, that they'd hook it and then it would just fall off or they just wouldn't be able to get it at all? I think it'd just be more difficult just because um, if you can see here with the grizzly bear claw, it is really, really long and kind of has this long hook. So to try and fish it out, they would have to really hook it. Uh, whereas this one, you've got your double hook and you can just do a little flick and you get a double chance of grabbing. The okay. other big difference between a grizzly bear claw and a polar bear claw is that the grizzly bear claw on the back is really flat, whereas oh, okay. this one isn't. Uh, and that's really good for digging for things like digging up roots and uh, gathering berries and stuff, which a grizzly bear would rely on. Okay. But a polar bear doesn't really have to do. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to peek at our chat there. If anybody did have any questions, we're getting close to the end here. But if there's anything you wondered about, any of the, the creatures or the uh, research or just living up in Inuvik and Ivivik, uh, we can check on there. Uh, I know when you joined us earlier this summer, you were sharing some of the research you do around songbirds. If any of you want to check out the Science World YouTube channel, you can see uh, Kyle and Ellen with us earlier and have a chance to listen to some of these wonderful songbirds that they uh, track and research there. What, what are some of the names of the birds that come up there? They have some wonderful names. Yeah, um, our five most popular songbirds that we've observed in Ivivik National Park are the American Robin, the Dark Eyed Junko, Common Red Pole, White Crown Sparrow, and Yellow Rumped Warbler. And what was the last one? Yellow Rumped Warbler. A Yellow a Rumped bomb. Warbler. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it feels to me that's almost like a Shakespearean insult. Like, <laughs> yeah. tell me, you Yellow Rumped Warbler. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it looks like we don't have questions coming in there. Uh, is there a way people can reach you or find out more about the parks if they did have um, curiosity later on? Yeah, absolutely. You can check out our websites. They have tons of information as well. Um, Kyle and I can also share our emails too, if that, if, is that an option? Yeah. Uh, we can certainly put it in the, the, the comments for this if people are interested in following up that way. So yeah, we can add that later on. Sure. Perfect. Excellent. Well, thank you all so much for joining us here today. Uh, again, if you're interested in more information about Canada's National Parks and Ivivik National Park, you can check out what is the website for your area there? If you just uh, Google search Ivivik National Park, that'll be one of the first things that comes up for sure. Mm -hmm. Nice. Uh, and if you're interested in more events from Science World, you can check out scienceworld.ca slash today slash events or follow us on all, any of our social channels, Twitter, Facebook, uh, YouTube, mash that subscribe button. I love mash, I'm getting better at that. Uh, you can find out about all the new programs coming up in the future. Thank you again to everyone for being part of it and big thank you to Kyle and Ellen for joining us all the way up there from Ivivik. Thanks everybody. Yeah. Thank Thanks you. everyone, have a great day. Woohoo.